Welcome everyone. My name is Brian Medina. My pronouns are Z here and here's, and I want to welcome you to our session, Constructions of Race and Jewishness, How Anti-Semitism Shapes and Is Shaped by the Racialization of Jewish People. On behalf of the University of Maryland and Office of Diversity and Inclusion, we welcome you to us in this session today. So live captioning is available. You can access this on the Zoom via the live transcript button on the bottom of your screen. A stream text link is also available if attendees prefer to view the captions in a separate browser window. So we have that link that we'll provide in the chat as well. So Tracy, if you want to advance us to the next slide for me, please. As we center ourselves in relationship with one another in this session and beyond, we also want to center ourselves in the place and space in which we occupy. So I'm going to read this land acknowledgement and ask for you to take a few moments to reflect upon it. Every community owes its existence and strength to the generations before them, around the world, who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy into making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will, some were drawn to migrate from their homes in hope of a better life, and some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. Truth and acknowledgement are critical in building mutual respect and connections across all barriers of heritage and difference. At the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, we believe it is important to create dialogue to honor those that have been historically and systematically disenfranchised. So we acknowledge the truth that is often buried. We are on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway people who are among the first in the Western Hemisphere. We were on indigenous land that was stolen from the Piscataway people by European colonizers. We pay respects to Piscataway elders and ancestors. If you could please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. We also want to thank and honor those who have been a part of this planning committee for so long. So you see on your screen the many contributors, folks that have been framing these conversations, and we just want to appreciate them in community with us, which this would never be possible without their help and support. The Office of Diversity of Inclusion is also proud to be partnering with our colleagues at the College of Arts and Humanities, at the Meyerhoff Program and Center for Jewish Studies to present the series on Jewish identity and anti-Semitism. Today's program is a third of a series, and if you've missed the earlier two, we welcome you to watch the recordings on our ODI YouTube channel. As Dr. Georgina Dodge, Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion, said in her opening remarks to the last session, ODI hopes that this series will validate and affirm Jewish members of the UMD family while giving all UMD community members a greater understanding and more tools to recognize and counter anti-Semitism when we see it. To get today's session started, I'm going to hand it over to your moderator, Tracy Guy Decker. Tracy is the co-host and co-creator of the podcast, Jews Talk Racial Justice with April and Tracy. And she has been working with ODI and the advisory committee on this series. Welcome, Tracy. Thanks so much, Brian. Um, <clears throat> I am um, really grateful to ODI um, and to all of you who are here on this Zoom webinar with us today. Um, it is it's really gratifying to have the opportunity to learn with you today. And I'm really excited about the chance to learn from your wonderful panelists who I will introduce you to now. Uh, I'll start with Professor Eric Goldstein who is the Judith London Evans Director of the TAM Institute for Jewish Studies and an Associate Professor of History and Jewish Studies at Emory. Professor Goldstein's areas of interest include American Jewish history and culture, modern Jewish history, and American social and cultural history of the 19th and 20th centuries. Professor Goldstein is the author of many articles, book chapters, and books, including The Price of Whiteness, Jews, Race, and American Identity. Welcome, Eric. It's great to be with you again. Professor Beverly Mitchell teaches courses in systematic theology, church history, 
including African American religious history and human rights at Wesley Theological Seminary. She is the author of numerous articles and two books related to human dignity, including Plantations and Death Camps, Religion, Ideology, and Human Dignity. Professor Mitchell's most recent scholarship has focused on the threats to human dignity in the face of white supremacy and its perpetuation of racial inequity. Welcome. And finally, lecturer and UMD alumna Sherelle Dowdy teaches in UMD's Meyerhoff Center for Jewish Studies and UMD's Gildenhorn Institute for Israel Studies. A PhD candidate at the University of California, Berkeley, her research and teaching engage with intersections of race, gender, and identity, especially surrounding groups' use of representation of others to construct their own identities, and how different socio-political positions and conceptions mold, mold different modes of representation. Welcome. Thank you to all three of you for being here. If we could get a spotlight on all three. Excellent. Thank you so much. So we're going to just, I'm just going to dive in. Um, a couple of months ago, there was quite a kerfuffle when Whoopi Goldberg said on the television show, The View, she said that the Holocaust was not about race. Now, Whoopi's sense that the Jewish victims and Nazi perpetrators of the Holocaust were all white people jibes with her experience of race and whiteness in 21st century America. But it isn't historically accurate because race was constructed differently then and there than it is now and here. And so Eric, I wanna ask you if you can help us understand more deeply the ways in which Jewish was considered a race both before and during the Nazi regime. Sure. Thank, first of all, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm a native Marylander, so it's always wonderful to address a Maryland audience. The, the, the history of, of constructions of race is, is a very um, complex one, and, and I would even resist the, the idea of saying there was one construction of race then and one now, because I would say in, in certain contexts today, Jews could also be constructed as a race. Uh, although I agree with what you said that, that, that the predominant understanding of race in the US today is one based on color. Um, and it was likewise messy and complex and, and, you know, and didn't fit one model in, in the United States in the 19th century. And there was yet another uh, you know, somewhat different understanding of race in Europe uh, than there was in America in the period before World War II. So we're dealing with a kind of moving target and it just points to the fact that, uh, you know, as scholars would describe it, race is a social construction and it really depends on the specific social, political, cultural context uh, in which uh, these ideas are, are located. Um, Jews uh, have been called a race and, and also have referred to themselves as a racial group um, you know, throughout modern times. And uh, there are even scholars now of, of medieval Jewish history who are locating ways in which concepts akin to race uh, you know, were even used during the Middle Ages to describe Jews and, and some other groups. Uh, certainly by the early modern period, uh, one of the prime examples pointed to is the, the purity of blood statutes that emerged in Spain um, during the Inquisition when conversos, Jews who had converted to Christianity, were still seen as a, a, an other in Spanish society and were prevented from, for example, holding certain public offices uh, because they were not thought to have the same purity of, of blood um, as Christians who weren't descendants of, of converts. So you, you have these very early examples. And, and as ideas about race developed within your, the European scientific uh, world, it became more and more common to use this um, as a way of understanding Jewishness, you know, as well as the identity of many other groups. Um, and then, of course, in the context of, of colonization and slavery, um, you know, race became used to, to understand many, many different groups, sometimes in, in different ways. Um, certainly also European nationalism was a, 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 
cause of how Jews, you know, in the context of various European countries in which they lived as concepts of nationalism emerged during the 19th century, those often relied on a racial self-understanding of say, Germ you know, Germans, um, other, other European nationalities who were, were um, asserting a particular national identity that, that was not neatly detached from a kind of biological hereditary self-understanding. And so Jews as a, as a primary outsider group in many of those societies were understood not only as culturally different um, from the majority culture, but you know, racially and biologically different. And it points to the fact that unlike today in the 19th century, um, there was not really a neat distinction between culture and biology. And so the way that we talk about culture um, today is different in the 19th century, it would have been understood as a kind of innate set of characteristics that, that inhered in a particular group that were part of their kind of inborn character. Um, the other context I wanna raise is the context of emancipation. Jews in the pre-modern period were a, a separate group, even though they lived in many different countries, wherever they lived, they typically formed a totally different society. We, we tend to think of them as a religious group today often, but, but in the pre-modern times especially, their difference consisted of not just religious difference, but, but all sorts of difference. They, they lived in separate areas, they spoke different languages, they had different professions, there were different sets of laws that, that you know, so they were really, Jewish was a, an entire way of life and, and, and you know, it, it encompassed all aspects of life, not just religion. And in the modern period, when Jews were able to become citizens of Western states, um, it challenged this all encompassing definition of what it meant to be Jewish. So if you were now a, a, a citizen of England or Germany or the United States, um, it raised the question then, what did it mean to be Jewish? What, uh, how would Jewishness need to be attenuated or compartmentalized to fit with these new you know, national identities? So one answer was that many states expected was that Jews would conceive of themselves as members of a particular denomination. So just like there were, um, you know, Christian citizens of these countries, Jews would have this as a religious identity, but in all other ways, they would be similar to other citizens of the state. But in, in practice, that, that never really worked out totally, that having had this history of being a separate people, also having had a pronounced history of persecution, there was a profound sense of Jews as being other in ways that went beyond religion. And within the Jewish community, there was a sense of difference and peoplehood and shared identity that, that couldn't be contained within the label of religious identity. And so in the modern context, race was often a word used both by Jews and non-Jews to sort of name this sense of difference that went beyond religion. We often today look back and think of it as a kind of artifact of Nazi uh, racism, which it certainly was, but it, but it was more than that, it, uh, the idea of the Jews as a race was very prevalent in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, it was not always intended as a malicious uh, description. It was just the way that many groups who were different than the majority culture uh, it was a term available and, and it fit kind of the assumptions about difference of that period. As I said, it was perhaps different in um, Europe than the United States. Um, I just want to say a few more words about the United States, since that's the focus of my work. Um, here, uh, there was an even more confused definition of race because you had sort of different contexts coming together in the context of immigration. So in other words, in the US, you have the history of colonization, slavery, um, the taking of land from Native Americans. Um, and so you had, on the one hand, one kind of racial map, which tended to understand race as a matter of color, but then it was also a country of immigration and you had many European groups coming to this country, uh, some of whom were um, you know, despised in different ways as, as outsiders. Um, and so you have the Irish coming to the United States, you have Jews, you have Italians, um, all sorts of different groups. And to some extent, those groups were also sometimes described in racial terms. 
Um, so you have this kind of, these different systems of understanding race bumping up against one another in the 19th century. For Jews specifically, I um, would say that um, there, there were some, there was some change over time. There were times in, in the 19th century, for example, when I think Jews, uh, immigrant Jews from say Germany or maybe the Russian empire could use the term race themselves as a sort of satisfying definition of their group identity. Um, and that did not necessarily place them outside of the, the bounds of whiteness. It did not uh, necessarily place them in the same category with people of color in terms of their relationship to US law or make them subject to segregation or put them in danger of losing certain civil rights, for example. Uh, but then throughout the late, especially beginning in the late 19th and early 20th century, there were certain moments when that racial understanding of Jewishness could become more dangerous and where there was a, especially during the period of Jim Crow and, and you know, during the progressive era, there was really a much more, a, a strong push to define racial categories more hierarchically, more precisely. There was a lot of debate and uh, discussion about racial divisions. Um, and in that context, there were times when American Jews were afraid uh, that, the, that the idea of being called a race or calling themselves a race might place them on outside of the, the definition of whiteness. Just to name a couple of quick incidents, you know, there was a, a a time when naturalization laws were perhaps, uh, there was a question as to whether Jews or Syrian immigrants, for example, qualified as quote, free white people, which is the legal definition that's in the natural, the early naturalization laws. Uh, there was a moment when the US Census Bureau was thinking of changing their racial classification system, not to just be black, white, et cetera, but to also include categories such as Hebrew that were used by the immigration officials. Um, and also, um, although they never faced the level of discrimination that, that African-Americans did or, or other people of color, during certain periods of US history, particularly, uh, particularly in the interwar years, there was quite a bit of what we might call structural discrimination against Jews in employment, in education, there were quotas at universities against Jews, there were neighborhood restrictions against Jews. So there were some real ways in which the concept of Jews as, as other and as, as perhaps racially different did, did have an impact, again, although different than a, uh, to a different extent than other groups, but it did have an impact on some of those aspects of daily life and, and the, the possibility for advancement in, in US society. Uh, so I would say that, you know, um, the, the classification of Jews as a race was not as, as clear and consistent and unquestionable uh, in US history before World War II, but it was a very contested uh, concept and that it was hard to shake the, the idea that Jews were somehow different racially, but what that exactly meant in different cases varied. Um, and World War II was both kind of the high point uh, of, of racial otherness. You know, the, during the interwar period, there was kind of an ever increasing level of anti-Semitism in the United States. But then World War II was a kind of watershed. And, and in the period after World War II, particularly, well, for two reasons. One, because of the bad, the particularly bad name that Nazi racism gave to the idea of labeling Jews as, as racially other. Um, and also because the, the changes in American political and economic culture as a result of the war ushered in a, a very quick social integration of Jews into the white mainstream. And so by the 1950s, it was almost unheard of to continue to refer to Jews as a race or to, for Jews to continue to refer to themselves as a race. Although I would say that uh, the, the sense of difference among Jews uh, continued in certain ways, but that, that vocabulary was no longer available as a way of expressing that. So I think I'll stop there and you know, we can come back to, to some questions later. Thank you. I actually think that that 
sort of background is great segue to what I want to ask um, Beverly about. Beverly, you have written and taught about the similarities between anti-Black oppression, especially through enslavement in the Americas, um, and the racialized anti-Semitism of the Nazis. Um, I find the title of your book so compelling, uh, Plantations and Death Camps. And I think, especially with that background that we just got from Eric about the ways that the actual behaviors of different groups kind of added to some sort of distinction um, is a really interesting background. And I'd love to hear from you more about the comparison that you make specifically around racialized oppression and how a group becomes racialized within that kind of hierarchy. Sure, um, thank you. I'm delighted to be a part of, of this conversation here. Um, in uh, the book, uh, Plantations and Death Camps, my uh, initial uh, idea was, was not to do a, 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 a any kind of comparison. And the comparison that's, that's done is uh, uh, more or less uh, identifying uh, strange similarities as I read uh, slave narratives and Holocaust survivor literature. And uh, I was astonished at the degree to which uh, their ex experiences, uh, which I kind of I, I, I connected with in terms of there being Jews uh, and African-Americans being set apart. Uh, I recall uh, uh, the discussions uh, ar around when they got on the transport and decisions were made who would go here and who would go there in terms of the camps and the kind of wrenching familial uh, separation uh, and the anguish uh, spoken about really connected with the experience of the enslaved when uh, mothers, fathers, children were separated uh, and, uh, you know, taken away to different places, never to hear for, from or connect with their people. So there, there, there are a number of things that uh, identify for me or establish for me that in looking at human dignity, I had two distinct, pos uh, um, distinct populations, uh, different historical dimensions. The differences, of course, were, were certainly there. But uh, what uh, I was thinking about is in terms of a common humanity uh, that, uh, and uh, defining, trying to define human dignity from the perspective of those who are dehumanized and what do we learn about that. Uh, I also, in, in, in this uh, traveling I did, was uh, not only to define what human dignity was in a way that it was universal for everyone and, and uh, uh, sort of uh, what makes it possible from my perspective as a, as a Christian to think of human beings as being created in the image of God. Um, I needed to address the issue of uh, anti-Semitism and, and racism. And I spent a lot of time reflecting on the connection. Uh, I saw too many similarities in terms of the attempt to erase the notion or raise the question of one's existence as a human being. Uh, I saw uh, the ways in which the, the, the sorrow and struggle from both populations really established for me that the dignity remained there despite the conditions in which they were placed. So my question was, well, what is the relationship between anti-Semitism and racism? And I redefined racism in terms of white supremacy because I was dissatisfied with the way race is often uh, talked about and defined more as a personal thing 
uh, not people not taking into account the power uh, differential and how uh, pervasive uh, racism is in a society in which uh, you have a strong racial hierarchy. And so I wanted to use white supremacy. But I've since found that I, that I see the connections between the two is more of uh, siblings under the umbrella of white supremacy. So I've uh, retained the notion of racism because it, it differentiates in a way uh, that suggests that white supremacy is not just a matter of race. It, it, it involves uh, uh, ethnicity. It, it involves a number of categories. And so the, the real defining moment is seeing white supremacy as a broad umbrella into which uh, people are being grouped into uh, certain classifications, whether they want to assume that identity or not. Uh, uh, white supremacy functions as a, a way of um, maintaining uh, power, control over uh, economics, the social uh, dimension, the political dimension, cultural, and it, it, it seeps into the very fabric of uh, 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 American life. So um, as I looked at how people are, are racialized, I was thinking about uh, the uh, anti-immigration of uh, those from the global South, uh, who are people of, of color, so to speak, uh, who are different culturally uh, in terms of language, et cetera, that becomes part of their racialization, even if they are not a race. And so uh, in terms of um, Asians who uh, tend to be viewed as um, the ultimate foreigner at uh, you know because of the appearance of, of their features are under this umbrella of white supremacy and we're noticing particularly since uh, post 9 uh, 11 that Muslims have taken on uh, by the beholder characteristics that are starting to define them in terms of racialized uh, ways, uh, despite the, the, the vast difference in terms of culture, language, many things uh, that uh, you, you think of when you, you know, think of, of Muslims, but they are, the, they're seen as Arabs, that's conflated, a way of viewing them. And then the media employs all sorts of ways of fashioning uh, what a Muslim looks like in terms of characters uh, and, and et cetera. And so there's a functioning in which there is a, the use of caricatures and stereotypes to justify uh, otherizing people. And these things, the, the characteristics of them become uh, they are seen as innate, perpetual, uh, almost ontological at times, uh, or always pathological. They're, they're, they are, their existence is problematized. And, uh, and so they are glued into this, whether they're, that's their, the, their self-identity or not. And, and so the issue uh, wasn't simply just comparing two, two groups, uh, but really as a way of, of understanding, uh, can we speak of the dehumanized when you have uh, photographs of uh, those who were being released in, in the camps after World War II, the emaciated, uh, almost looking spookily, <laughs> 
if that's a word, inhuman, and and uh, and and look in terms of photographs of of slaves, ex-slaves, uh, in, in which their bodies were deformed by the, by the use of the lash. How can you talk about human dignity in, in that context? And, and my response was our shame when we see these things, human beings that participated in this, that it speaks to the fact that whether they cry out vocally or not, they, their very existence is a protest that, uh, def that gives a yes, if you will, to the notion that they maintain that dignity. It might be violated, assaulted, but it remains there. Uh, and, and so uh, these uh, comparisons or, or talk, talking about them are not simply just to, um, you know, see them side by side, which some people resist when they, mm -hmm. when they uh, look at it. But uh, I operate from a notion of a common humanity. And what happens to you uh, matters, has to matter to me as a human being. What happens to me ought to be a matter of, of concern to you because we're linked together uh, theologically as being made in the image of God and what that means. And, and so that sort of uh, leads to the ways in which um, the hope and, and call and challenge is the pro promotion, protection uh, of the dignity of, of all human beings. So it, it's part of, uh, if you will, anti-white supremacy or anti-racism, however you want to define it, such that the fight of, of Jews, um, uh, uh, when I think about uh, Charlottesville and the two populations that surfaced in terms of uh, the, the white nationalists, uh, white identity folks, were the problem of Jews and the problem of African Americans. You had burning crosses and burning swastikas. Mm -hmm. You had lots of uh, references to the old way of uh, uh, talking about Jews that people had hoped had disappeared. It, ap it, 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 it appears and to me, there, there, there's something there with regard to the fact that these two populations, uh, at least in the United States, remain, uh, their existence is in some way problematic. Of course, there are um, ways that you can uh, kind of, un uh, or need to unpack it uh, and uh, uh, illustrate the complexity of, of this, but but this was this another example would be Dylan Roof, mm. who uh, shot nine people, including a pastor, mm -hmm. at a Bible study that he sat in for an hour, mm -hmm. and uh, because you know he's part of a group and imbibing all sorts of, of propaganda in which both again both. African American and Americans and Jews were part and parcel of what's being looked, uh, you know, uh, um, resisted. So, uh, you know, I think there are observed in terms of my observation. I'm I'm trying to to understand the interconnections between these experiences. Uh, such that uh, hopefully, you know, help people to recognize that they have a stake in what happens uh, to other populations. The, the attacks on Asians that we're experiencing because of COVID and rising uh, says that, uh, at least to me, these are human beings that we have to look out for. Thank you. I think I'll start. I'll stop there.
Yeah, we'll we'll circle back around. Um, Sherelle, I'm going to turn to you. Um, and I think we've we've talked a lot now about um, racialization um, in the eye of the beholder, as Beverly just put it. Um, and I'd, I'd like to come back to you. Eric kind of mentioned it, but if you could go into a little bit more, more um, detail about Jewish reactions to the representations that we've been thinking and talking about, what, what were there, what were Jewish reactions to the representations of Jews as race? Um, or did, did they react against it? Did they fall in line, like both and? If you could just talk a little bit more about how that has historically happened in terms of the racialization of Jews within the Jewish community. It's definitely both and, and it uh, depends on the time and place and particular subset of the community. Um, I'll be the outlier though and share a PowerPoint. Great. Ah, I can't, I can't oh. share it. I think you need to okay. give permission. Okay, try again. Um, do you guys see the PowerPoint? Yep. And you don't see it with the Zoom on top, right? Right. Okay. Um, yeah, so I wanted to actually start by, and Eric touched on some of the things that I'm gonna start with, but um, the question of how Jews have historically seen their collective identity, partly to understand why the terms that we use now can be so confusing to us. Um, so as you all know, Jews have been widely dispersed for at least 2000 years and have developed very different cultures, um, adopted local languages, appearances. And so it's not necessarily obvious what creates or reinforces a sense of collective identity. And so there's um, shared textual and interpretive tradition, um, continual circulation of texts and people across these communities, common sacred language of Hebrew, uh, shared collective narrative and origin story in the Hebrew Bible, and there are Hebrew terms, Klal Yisrael, Am Yisrael, that don't translate very well onto our modern terms of race, ethnicity, or nation. And race, we tend to associate with appearance and Jews look all kinds of ways. Um, ethnicity, there are a lot of Jewish ethnicities because Jews come from different places. Um, nation, we tend to associate with territory. So that also, um, you know, there's Israel, but overall it's not a sufficient concept for Jewish identity broadly. Sherelle, are you able to click slideshow? It'll make it bigger for all of us. Yeah. Easier to read if, you, if you're able to. Yeah. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, so um, Eric mentioned this, the, the challenge of modernity uh, is that there, what happens is that it really cracks the bedrocks of Jewish identity. And the change, you know, there's a positive aspect that there, is, there are new opportunities for Jews in the process of emancipation starting in the late 1700s and beyond, um, but this dismantles Jewish autonomy. There is a demand that Jews assimilate. So for example, I have on the slide, um, Gordon, who was pushing for Jewish assimilation, he said, be a man in the streets and a Jew at home. And I just, I, I want to point out that man and Jew are not equivalent there. And man is, you know, the unmarked um, European Christian. So we also have a decline of Jewish languages, which is, significant because that's a vehicle of in-speak within the group. And so that, that declines. And there's also a foreign conception of religiosity that Jews are being expected to adopt where you know, they're supposed to conform to a Protestant idea of religion as private and of faith. And whereas Jewish religiosity was very uh, communal and practice-based. And then secularization, of course, is a general challenge to uh, ritual practice and how to how to how to feel about the texts that were unifying forces. So, in short, Jewish identity is and uh, is being challenged, and the how to think about it is being challenged also by Jewish racialization that comes up in these debates about emancipation. And the anti-pro um, position, I'll say that the anti is you know Jews are terrible. We accept all the stereotypes that have existed about Jews for a while. And those who are against emancipation said they'll always be terrible. This is something essential to Jews. 
the people who are pro say um, Jews are terrible, but they can be improved. So for example, um, one person said they're ugly, they stink, the men have hemorrhoids, which has been confused for Jewish male menstruation, but they can change. On the other side, they say you know, Jewish bodies and brains are inherently corrupted, and they also, they're physically not able to be citizens because they can't, they don't have the bodies to serve in the army. And the picture I have here is from much later, it's from Nazi Germany, but uh, it gives a very visual illustration of the difference between the Aryan body that's muscular and the, the deficient Jewish body. So from the perspective of Jewish self-representation, they, in order to gain rights, which is this great opportunity, they need to be able to conform and please the dominant society. So they have to contend with racialization in a way that they didn't need to before. And so there are different responses. Um, the, there's a group called the Maskirim, who they are, in, it depends on the period, but in uh, many of the periods, they're really pushing for assimilation, especially into bourgeois culture. And, um, but they also want to retain some sense of Jewishness. So for example, many of them are writing in um, Jewish languages, especially Hebrew, and they're trying to actually create a bit of an inferi inferiority complex in the Jews who are their audience. And the reason for this is to say, you know what, we, it's true the, the anti-Semites were right, we're bad, but uh, we need to, so we need to accept that, we need to see ourselves as having these problematic traits because we need to change that. And um, I have an example here of a, a text by um, Yud Lamed Golden, who was the one who said, you know, be a man in the streets and a Jew at home. And it's a, it's a fascinating novel, uh, The End of Joyous Sorrow. He wrote it in 1868 in Hebrew. So this is for Jewish audiences. And it uh, imagines um, the Maskilin, these more assimilated um, bourgeois Jews, collaborating with the Russian authorities against the, the Hasidim, the, the Hasidic Jews who are seen as a common enemy. And what they did basically is they were trying to project the anti-Semitic stereotypes onto the, the Hasidic Jews. So they're saying, so we are, we are Jews sort of, but we're, we're, we're Jews who can be proper men out in these public spaces. Um, whereas they, you know, they're the Jews, the anti-Semitic stereotypes, they don't apply to us anymore, but they do apply to them. So it's, it's essentially a fantasy of cooperating with the Russian authorities to uh, expel the Hasidic Jews from the town. And it ends with the victory that they, they flog these, these Jews and, and banish them. And so this, um, you know, this was very much commonplace in the rhetoric throughout much of the 1800s. But by the 1880s, um, when the, these fantasies of you know, success and integration in the Russian empire really faded, especially in the wake of, of pogroms or massacres against Jews, uh, there was a reevaluation of, of that whole way of thinking. And so on the other hand, so I'm showing now two extremes so that you know, there was the one extreme of you know, instilling the inferiority complex accepting the anti-Semitic stereotype, but trying to reform the Jews. And on the other hand, you have uh, refusals of this idea of Christian European superiority and attempt to maintain a, a Jewish identity that is, that is distinct and that even sees itself as superior. So this is an example of a Yiddish folk song. And because it's a folk song, I can't really date it, but it very well could be from the late 1800s. Um, with this battle of self-definition that was happening in these communities. And um, I'll read a little bit of the Yiddish and then translate. Gate a goy in schenkel rein, trink der dort a gläser le wein. Oi, schicker is a goy, trinken muss er weiter is a goy. So it says uh, a Gentile goes into a bar, and it's not the start of a joke, and uh, he drinks, he's drunk. Uh, he must drink because he is a Gentile. Uh, in contrast, the, the Jew goes into the house of study of the sacred texts, and he has, you know, a, a kiddush, he's sober, um, he must pray because he's a Jew. And then it continues, the, the Gentile leaves and he starts breaking things. He comes home, he beats his wife. Uh, the Jew, by contrast, he you know, kisses the mezuzah, he has a nice family life. 
So this is really trying to, to reinforce a sense of you know, that, that the way that Jews are, that the system that they, they have um, is good and it's better. And they, they're using stereotypes about Gentiles in order to reinforce their own identity. And the picture I have um, on the bottom, it shows that this, this is actually a song that's still sung in some of the communities that remain more insular from um, secular society. So this is still a tool that's used to reinforce that sense of identity. I'm gonna really quickly, just a, a point of definition for those who don't know, Kiddush is uh, the blessing over wine. So the, the comparison there that Sherelle, that the folk song is, is, is showing us is between a Jew drinking and a non, a Gentile drinking. So the Kiddush is um, over wine. Yeah. Just in case that was lost on anyone who doesn't know that word. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, and, and what's interesting is that the Jew drinks but doesn't get drunk. So there's moderation. Um, I'm not keeping track of time, so I'll conclude uh, quickly by just turning, you know, jumping way forward in time and space and turning to the case of American Jews and um, the use of humor in Jewish American self-representation as, I mean, first of all, distinct from the other examples I gave because it's outward facing towards not just Jewish, but also broader American audiences. Um, but it also it, at times can seek out a middle ground where it's, it, it is accepting certain Jewish stereotypes, but it's using it in a way that, um, you know, defangs them and shows Jews as not threatening or even cute. Um, but there also can be a subtle sense of the superiority of the weak neurotic Jew. And um, I don't know if we have time for the clip, but there's a, a Woody Allen bit where he talks about robberies in his building and people are like, oh, you're small, you need to hit the gym. And he tries and it doesn't go anywhere for him. So it ends up with him being attacked by this Neanderthal of a man. And he's trying to explain to the man, you know, you're, you're you know, broken home, bad economy, you know, like this is why you are how you are. And so there's this uh, kind of smart but weak Jew in, in this, uh, you know, certain type of Gentile figure in contrast. And, um, you know, the audience can laugh at it, laughing at, you know, the Jew using the stereotypes of himself. Um, but it, it also was a means of, um, kind of doing both, pleasing the Gentile audience while also not conceding everything in the way that you know, the earlier example of the, the Russian Moscow uh, did. Mm -hmm. So I'll end there. I just wanna bring something up briefly that maybe we can discuss later. Um, and Eric definitely would have a lot to say to this, but um, something that I'd be interested in hearing people's thoughts are, are the American Jewry and the construction of um, you know, whiteness or Jewish identity for those who pass as white um, how that has to be in relation to blackness. So I'll stop there, but maybe that's something we can touch on later. Great, thank you. Um, I think that that is an excellent question. Um, I wanna say to those of you in the audience, if if you wanna start putting questions that you might have in the Q&A so that I can feed them to the panelists, but I do have a few more questions, but putting that out there if you're thinking. Um, so I actually think that that, question that Sherelle just posed, Eric, you are perfectly suited to talk on. Um, I think that the Al, the Al Jolson example is a really good one. Briefly for our audience, I will just name that um, Al Jolson's The Jazz Singer, um, I believe it was the first talkie. It was the first motion picture with, with sound. And Jewish audiences um, really celebrated it. He actually, he is a cantor in the movie and he sings Kol Nidre, which is a, a very important, deeply holy song, totally in um, Aramaic, I think, um, Hebrew anyway. And so um, a lot of Jews were like, this is amazing to see our rep ourselves represented on screen in the very first talking picture. In the same movie, Jolson wears blackface. And as recently as uh, 2016, I heard a Jewish, a white Jewish teacher say like, this was amazing. He felt so confident that he could sing Kol Nidre in the first talking picture. And I was like, yeah, but the blackface. And he was like, that's immaterial. Clearly not immaterial. <laughs> 
I sent him your book, Eric, <laughs> after he said that. And I would love for you to like maybe expound on that just a little bit. Right. Well, I think one of the things Sherelle was pointing to in her remarks is that a lot of Jewish identity issues come out of the, the complex set of feelings and pressures and uh, that emerge from being a group that on the one hand had a history of being outsiders and, and were not accepted on equal terms, uh, but on the other hand had in certain contexts and particularly the United States, had the ability to, to gain acceptance, uh, but, but that acceptance came at, at a certain price of conformity, assimilation, downplaying their difference. So you see within that context, um, you know, some of the things she was talking about of, of Jews internalizing some of the stereotypes of the larger society about themselves, uh, working so hard to fit in, but then struggling with the implications of what it means to fit in both in terms of the extent to which they had to reject their own cherished sense of self, sense of difference, traditions, um, you know, feelings of connections to one another. Uh, and in the American context, it also meant becoming part of the white population and part of fitting in and gaining the acceptance of, of the white dominant culture was to, to some extent uh, conforming to and 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 signaling that they were on the the quote right side of the racial divide. So, if you were a Jew who lived in the Jim Crow South, it meant you know conforming to patterns of segregation, uh, not not appearing to be, especially as a community that was different, uh, some kind of an obstacle to to the racial divisions of society. Um, not troubling the, the categories according to which the larger society understood itself. Um, and so, you know, the jazz singer is an example of a kind of identity struggle where, you, you know, you have this character played by Al Jolson. He's at once trying to fit into the, to the white, you know, non-Jewish native born American world of, of not exactly Hollywood, but show business. Um, and then, but on the other hand, it's a drama of him being pulled toward Jewish traditions. His father, he was a descendant of cantors. He, they wanted him to chant the Kol Nidre prayer. Um, and so in that sense, the, the, the use of blackface minstrelsy, um, at least this is the way that some, some critics of that movie, you know, analysts of that movie have seen it, uh, could be understood to play multiple roles. Clearly it is a, a sign of the embrace of the standards of white America of, of racism, of being part of the, um, you know, undifferentiated white dominant population, because, um, you know, the assumption is you, you put on blackface if you're white. Um, some people have also seen it as uh, suggesting also a, a, another layer of complexity that uh, in that scene where he dons the blackface, he's also, it's precisely the scene where he's imagining his family and considering his role vis-a-vis uh, -vis his Jewishness. So there's some sense that it was also a kind of mask uh, that he could, that as a, as a person assimilating into white culture, he couldn't deal with his Jewishness openly and outwardly and candidly. And so he used black identity as a kind of mask, as a way of a foil for thinking about otherness. Um, so it's, a, it's complicated, and I, but I think it points to the way in which there, there have been attractions, uh, there have been connections between African-Americans and Jews. Um, uh, and I think to understand it from a Jewish identity point of view, part of it has been the story of a group that on the one hand was becoming part of white America, was assimilating to an extent into white America, and yet part of that, and this is what I sort of refer to in my book as the price of whiteness, meaning uh, not, not that Jews were treated like African-Americans, but there's also a type of experience of an assimilating group where, where, as I said, they have to kind of, they're expected to give up certain aspects. There is a kind of price uh, of entry into that society. And there was also an emotional toll. And, and so to the extent that Jews mourned to some extent or yearned for a sense of difference that they had to give up, they often found some sense of connection to that or maintained a certain sense of connection to that by in some cases being allies to African-Americans or it, it wasn't always such a, 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 a glorious story as, as being a civil rights advocate, but 
having a connection to African-American culture or music. Uh, but in that way, using that type of dif that, that difference as a, as a way of, you know, sort of by remote control, remain having some connection to their sense of difference and otherness, even as they assimilated and accepted their, their role in the, in the dominant white society. So it points to a, the very complicated emotional, psychological identity conflicts of a group that was, was a, a persecuted minority in, in some ways, you know, continues to think of itself as a group that is somehow other or different, but at the same time has had tremendous opportunities of, of inclusion and, and advancement in American society. And how do you navigate that? How do you balance those contrary impulses, those contrary feelings? And so I think some of these cultural phenomena reflect that, that collision of being both an insider and an outsider and how Jews in the United States have navigated that. I'm going to pivot a little bit and also kind of work in a question from the audience. Um, these conversations about Jewish racialization, I often find a little uncomfortable um, as a white Ashkenazi Jew. One of my, my father was not actually Jewish. Um, and so, um, but he was white. Uh, and so I am accepted as Jewish without question in Jewish spaces. If he had been of another race, I would have a very different experience. Um, and I today work with many amazing and talented Jews of color, whether by birth or by choice, and they, they don't fit at all in what we've just been talking about. Um, so my question around Jews of color is twofold. One, um, how can we, as we talk about it, sort of honor the truth and the harm of the really racialization of Ashkenazi Jews, like the equation of Jewishness with whiteness um, that sort of erases uh, Jews of color. And also I'm wondering if through that process, and this is um, from uh, Maxine Grossman in um, the questions is asking if um, maybe the, maybe opening up um, the diversity within a group could help us to counter the dehumanizing aspects of sort of the othering. So the two full questions, and I'm not sure whoever kind of wants to jump in, but we can all uh, kick this one around. Uh, I, you know, I would say that that your question and the, the question of Max, Maxine uh, really illustrates the the absurdity of these classifications, which work in order to ensure that one group uh, calls the shots, uh, gets the the resources. Uh, and enjoys a, a degree of privilege, while the others were, are classified as different, do not. Um, and and it, it raises the question of uh, why do I have to be defined by someone else? Let me define myself. Um, and I think that uh, the sort of uh, homogenizing uh, everyone in a group together it is part of the way uh, a racial ide ideology works. It's part and parcel of, of the whole ball of wax. Uh, no one tends to think of the diversity, say, necessarily within the African-American community. We're, we're all one, one person can speak for all. And uh, the nuances, the differences in gifts and talents, uh, the differences in class and opportunity are thrown out. But uh, from my perspective, I see it as uh, part and parcel of the way ideologies in which you're defining people uh, based on the degree to which they, the in-group wants other people in. I, it, it's a, an awful human um, propensity 
that creates tremendous grief from my perspective. I want to bring a little historical perspective to the question of Jews of color, which is, which I think injects a hopeful note because I I see throughout Jewish history there have been conflicts between different types of Jews or groups of Jews of different origins, one who didn't accept the other as legitimately Jewish or had a certain understanding of Jewishness based on their origin, which which and then were shocked to find there were Jews of of, of a different type. Uh, when even among, you know, Ashkenazic Jews, when East European Jews came to this country in the late 1800s, there were well-established Jews from, from Germany and Western Europe. And in the pages of the American Jewish press, uh, it's clear that, that those more established Jews saw these newcomers as somehow different, even in a racial sense. Isaac Mayerweiss referred to uh, East European Jews as, as wild Asiatics and, and, you know, just to give you an example. And yet over a period of time, not too many years, those senses, those, that sense of division and difference melted away and they were, they considered themselves a more coherent group. In Atlanta, we have a community of Jews uh, of Sephardic origin, mostly from the island of Rhodes uh, and, and Turkey. Um, who came here at the turn of the 20th century. And in the context of the Jim Crow South, there was also a sharp division between Ashkenazic Jews and these Jews who, who looked a little different and, and, um, and uh, by the time of World War II and certainly today, the, you know, the, those families are all married to one another and, and that no one would ever think to consider those somehow, uh, you know, those divides as significant. So my hope is that just as in those cases, that it, it, it becomes more normal and more common uh, to, to have a greater diversity within the Jewish community. That, and, I, and I see it even in, in my own congregation, you know, where it's a matter of it, people becoming used to it and, and it becoming more the norm, and, it, and then the difference becomes less pronounced. So I think my hope as a historian is with time, as in these cases, the, you know, these divisions shift and change, and that that the definition of Jewishness, the definition of Jewish peoplehood, is flexible enough that it it there will be a different understanding of it in the future than maybe there is today. I also just want to say that I, to the extent that I see the Jewish struggle with with American racial categories as as a really primary obstacle to the expression of Jewish identity. Jews have, um, as I said, had to give up a certain uh, sense of their difference and, and have not been fully able to assert their sense of difference from the you know, dominant culture because they had to fit into this category of white. So I think here Jews of color can play an extremely important leadership role and for the Jewish community and that insofar as their, their role in the Jewish community will help disentangle the categories of Jewishness and whiteness. If those categories no longer are seen as, you know, uh, the same, um, I think it, it can help, um, you know, make Jewishness uh, l less restricted, less, less hemmed in by the expectations that they will not, not be too different from the majority of, of, of white society. Well, do you wanna? Well, something else that I've found heartening um, lately in, in reaction to the Black Lives Matter, Lives Matter movement uh, has been a lot of Jewish institutions really bringing the voices of Jews of color forward and having these conversations. And I mean, in the US especially, there's an association of Jews with white Ashkenazi Jews. And so the more we bring conscious awareness to the inaccuracy of that, um, the more there is space to, to move forward. And I, I just remember this moment when I was teaching and I mentioned um, Jews from other places, from Muslim lands, et cetera, just the shock of some students that, that those Jews existed. Uh, but I, I lived in Israel for a while and in Israel, it's, there are Jews from all over. So you, you see Jewish diversity. Uh, it's also very problematic there in terms of hierarchies, but you see Jewish diversity in a way that uh, has been hidden for a lot of Americans and American Jews. So I'm glad that's coming to the fore more. Beverly, please. Uh, 
I, I would like to, to put something on the table. Um, I, I have encountered uh, Jews of color uh, who uh, very poignantly talk about the difficulty of, of their Jewishness being acknowledged. They experience at times the same racial um, soft-pedaled hostility uh, uh, that they would, whether they were Muslim or Christian, but it's their, their color that uh, distinguishes them. And, you know, I, as I'm listening to this discussion regarding the Ashkenazi Jews, um, and hearing the extolling of perhaps, you know, they can be included within the whole, um, you know, uh, Jewish community. My, my, my question is, what happens to the racial hierarchy when people who can assimilate do? It does nothing to, to challenge or dismantle the racial hierarchy. Uh, uh, persons of color, like there is no way that I could pass anywhere in terms of uh, uh, the larger uh, dominant society. Um, I, I, I wish I could hope those who uh, are who have a little taste of how the uh, hierarchy works uh, can uh, collaborate together to dismantle uh, the whole thing um, is what I'm thinking. I think that's a, a really interesting question and framing. I mean, one of the things that coming into this panel that was on my mind is, you know, I, I framed it about Whoopi Goldberg's comments, Whoopi Goldberg was thinking about race as a binary, which is how we have been taught today in America. It, it is, it's, it's white and not white. And, um, and Whoopi looked at the Ashkenazi Jews and the German Nazis and saw just white. And, 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 <clears throat> and that is how we've been taught to think about it. But obviously it's much more complicated than that as the past hour has been you know, unraveling. And one of the things that I'm interested in that I think your question kind of gets to is what are the moments, what are the moments when that whiteness, which I think Eric, maybe you, maybe I learned this phrase from you, con the conditional whiteness that, um, that Ashkenazi Jews have been granted, what are the conditions under which it is revoked? Right. We saw, I, I have a question from someone in the um, audience sort of pointing out the fact that white Jewish and black experiences are not identical, but are interconnected. And they bring up the Unite the Right rally, which started as a sort of pro Confederacy, but also included the Jews will not replace us chance. Um, What's the question, Trace? So <laughs> I guess I'm, I'm interested in hearing any one of you talk a little bit more about the conditions in which that whiteness is not granted and how we could leverage the conditional nature of it to Beverly's question to help sort of dismantle the hierarchy altogether. I could say something about that. I, I... I think what, what you said is correct that, um, or, or the, the questioner asked, that anti-Semitism in the United States is not the same. It has different origins. It has different assumptions than, than say, anti-Black racism, but they, they are connected in important ways. Um, my own sense of looking at this over a historical time period is that um, while Jews were expected to fit in and conform in, in, in many cases, um, the, the moments in which anti-Semitism has flared in the United States is when white society could no longer explain or, or construct a stable worldview out of their, their typical black-white racial hierarchy, 
but when, and moments when they lost confidence in themselves and they needed to turn in on their own society and find some loose link mm -hmm. within the white population to explain something that couldn't be explained according to the normal white supremacist logic. So in the Leo Frank case, for example, in Atlanta, where you have a, 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 a situation of the industrialization of the South and the plight of, of poor white workers, in, in that moment, there was a kind of crisis of confidence and, and the Jewish factory owner became a much more satisfying other in that specific context. And I think you, you see that happening to some extent today. There's a great piece by this uh, about this by Eric Ward who is the uh, executive director of the Western States Center in Portland. It's, it's online for those who wanna Google it. It's called Skin in the Game, How Anti-Semitism Animates White Nationalism. And, and he, his idea kind of fits with my observations that I just made. Um, he says that among white nationalists today, they can't really explain a lot of things in American society um, the, 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 the important role that African-Americans play in our society, the fact that we've had a black president, all kinds of things don't really fit with their white supremacist worldview. And so uh, they include anti-Semitism as a way of helping them explain this. And, and um, they see Jews and African-Americans and, and other people of color as being in collusion, as Jews as a kind of loose link within white society. So in the Pittsburgh shooting, you have Jews being accused of helping uh, Mexican immigrants come across the border. Um, you know, th this is a common way in which anti-Semitism, it, it, Jews are viewed a little differently. They're viewed as a powerful, sinister group that operates behind the scenes. That's a kind of loose link in white society. So in that sense, it's, it has some different uh, motivations and, and, and it manifests itself somewhat differently than, than say anti-Black racism or anti immigrant sentiment or anti-Muslim sentiment, but you can see how they're sort of like mutually supporting ideologies and they work in concert with one another. And it's often the same people who, who find both of these as, as sort of two parts of a, of a worldview. So just to take the, it, to circle back to what Beverly was saying, about, you know, I totally agree that, um, you know, we can't solve the problem of, let's say, Jews of color are facing in the Jewish community. We can't solve the problem of Jewish identity and how Jews are able to be in the United States as a proud cultural group that's able to express their distinctiveness. All of this relies on the dismantling of these categories of racial hierarchy, because those are the underlying categories that are demanding that people of European ancestry assimilate to some kind of a stable you know, monolithic white identity. Um, and so all, it's all of a piece, you know, I think uh, building on Eric Ward's idea, Jews not only have skin in the game fighting white racism and white nationalism because that's also a way of fighting anti-Semitism. That's his point that he's trying to make, but also because Jews will, Jews and, and all groups will never, will never have a truly pluralistic society in which all groups are free to celebrate their cultural distinctiveness until we get rid of the hierarchy of race, which privileges uh, one type of being over another. And, and for some people that means, you know, they will always be other or less than. And for some groups, it means they will never be, a, uh, uh, they're always expected to, to be the same and to, to assimilate and not to be different. And all of those things emanate from this system of racial hierarchy. So I think ultimately none of these goals can be realized. That that is should be everyone's common goal who shares any of these problems. Eric, that was a beautiful commercial for our next session <laughs> in this series where we're going to dive into Eric Ward's um, hypotheses and look at solidarity as a possible antidote. Um, uh, the final time is to be confirmed, but stay tuned. If you're, if you're in the audience, you will get an email about it. Um, Sherelle, do you want to comment on this? Um, yeah, I, um, I was reminded of, so the, in the 1920s, uh, the immigrants from Eastern Europe in the Yiddish press, um, there was a, you know, not only a sense of Jewish solidarity with the experiences of African Americans, though, the, of course, they said this is parallels Jews experience in Europe, not Jews experience in the U.S., but I, I bring this up because it also went with socialist and communist ideology. So there was an idea of 
the only way to really tackle this is to dismantle the current power structure. And um, you know, there are questions today. I mean, white Ashkenazi Jews are very entrenched in the current power structure in real ways. Um, so there is a question of you know, whether and how to challenge that when it might not be in the interest of a lot of those people to challenge it. So that's just something I wanted to, to bring up. Yeah, yeah, I think that is ultimately a, a key a key question that will need to be addressed to get to the um, the future that Eric and Beverly have just sort of pointed toward um, with the dismantling of the hierarchy. Um, so we're coming close to time. We're not there yet. I, I want to acknowledge that this is a conversation for the University of Maryland community, including and especially the leaders, activists, and chain make, change makers of tomorrow. So I want to like kind of close this out by talking a little bit about solidarity. Um, we do not need to have identical experiences in order to build solidarity. Um, and there are some key lessons that we can glean from sort of putting them in conversation. I, I remember, I think it was maybe even the same day where I went, I visited the US Holocaust Memorial Museum and also the new National Museum of African American History and Culture. And so I saw broken glass from Crystal Knox and broken stained glass from um, the bombing of the church in Birmingham where the four girls died. And the those two like artifacts in that same day, just there was a bright line for me between them. Not that that means that as a Jew, I understand what it's like to be black in America, but just to sort of have some of that, that the resonance um, that can hope that can bring us towards solidarity. Anyway, what I'm, what I'm, what I want to ask the three of you is knowing that um, these future change makers and leaders are listening. What, what do you have to say to them? Um, who the, these young people who are trying to make sense of the intersections of race and racism and anti-Semitism and anti-Jewish bias and other oppressions and how they can sort of be a part of that uh, radical imagined future that, that we have been starting to point to. Don't everybody jump in at once. <laughs> well, uh, I guess I'll jump in. Um... I mean, I think it's just important to, for everyone to listen to one another. And I think so often in identity politics and, and uh, people, people are, of course, proudly staking out their, their own identities. But I, I think we always have to listen to one another and understand that there are different perspectives on these things. And um, too often these, these discussions across different groups can turn into a kind of competition of, uh, you know, persecution and, and that, you know, someone's identity feels threatened by someone else's assertion of mm -hmm. victimhood or, or persecution or something like that. And I think as much as possible, the first question we always have to ask is to look inward and think about what, what can I do to try to be more understanding, to try to hear somebody else's voice um, and I think if we start more from that position always then uh, my voice isn't being heard, you know, that we will all hear each other uh, more effectively. Yeah, we call that competition oppression Olympics, right? Like who had it, who had it worse? And um, yeah, it, the oppression Olympics never end well be, because there can be no winner. <laughs> there can be no winner of the oppression Olympics. Sherelle or Beverly, do you want to chime in? Uh, I'll, I'll say um, a, a couple of things. Uh, you know, that yearning to move us toward uh, the vision uh, that Eric was describing means that people who are serious uh, about wanting to see change uh, is asking themselves what identity they want to claim for, for themselves. Uh, where are they going to place themselves in the struggle uh, in terms of uh, the divisions that um, uh, befall us? Uh, I think uh, for some, this will involve a willingness to surrender 
one's privilege, uh, the, the privilege that come from being part of a particular segment of, of the population. And what, you, what, what are we prepared to give up? And the, and the last thing that it occurs to me, I mean, I like the idea that Eric raised of talking to each other. I, I think you can't have, uh, you can't start to think about any kind of reconciliation that will lead to justice without those conversations. But um, if you don't see someone else's history uh, as part of your own, the, the larger story, if you're not interested in, you know, uh, learning about people who are not part of your group, uh, it's going to be uh, rather difficult. But I think it's possible. I think the example for me was the photograph of uh, the rabbi from the Tree of Life synagogue uh, uh, coming down to Charleston to uh, 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 worship in solidarity in some way uh, with the uh, pastor that replaced uh, Clementa Pinckney, and they're coming together. Uh, you know, it, it because it was a recognition that what happens to you has or could uh, happen to me, and you know, standing with people in those those moments uh, to work to prevent uh, the recurrence of those moments. I think um, if you're serious about pursuing this, you know, this path. With, in terms of listening, I would add to um, a willingness to listen to ideas that seem shocking at first because they challenge the way that we know the or we think we know the world to work um, for example this was a conversation i had with a lot of people about the the concept of what what could the world look like without policing and without prisons and a lot of people have a knee-jerk reaction of oh that's just not possible so i mean being able to at least think about it what is your model of the human what is your model of society um, how can we think outside of what is familiar I think that also needs to be part of the conversation. Yeah, I, I, I'm i gonna actually come back to something that Eric said about hope, um, about the sort of the German and the Eastern European Jews, when I, like that historical precedent actually was very helpful. In Baltimore, um, where I'm from, there was a large German population. And then as the Russian and Polish Jews came later in the 20th century, there was this huge divide. I mean, you look back at the press and, and it was, this, it was, it was unheard of that there would be intermarriage between the Russian and the German Jewish populations. And now like nobody knows, like it's, it's, it's a meaningless difference now. And I think that's part of, that's a historical precedent for exactly what Shirelle is talking about. If you spoke to the Jews of Baltimore in the 1880s, they wouldn't be able to imagine that these two groups, and then, you know, now it, we don't even remember. Um, that is about all the time that we have. For those of you in the audience, um, I wanna ask you if you could please take a couple minutes. We're gonna put a um, post event survey in the chat for you. It will only, it will not take you very long. Um, it'll be very quick. And also if you would like to stay up to date on other events that ODI does, including the final one in this series, please subscribe to the ODI newsletter and you will get all of the information. As I said, we're planning for the final one to be exactly what Eric brought up, which is white nationalism and the way that anti-Semitism and um, anti-Black race and anti-everybody <laughs> uh, racism, anti-immigrant sentiment um, are wrapped up together and marbled through in white nationalism to violent and deadly consequences as Eric alluded to, um, and, and Beverly as well. And we are gonna talk about specifically about solidarity and what solidarity can look like to as an antidote to that marbled um, hatred. So, um, oh, the survey says you need permission. Okay, I will fix that.
Allison, could you take a look at that, please? Um, that's all I had to say. Thank you all for joining us. This was really, uh, it, it feels weird to say it was enjoyable since it was such heavy, but it really was. I, it was very generative and um, thank you all. And thanks to those of you in the audience as well. We'll see you next time.